<laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to Women Matters, the edition of February 2019. And today we will continue with the topic of last time, which was resilience. And we felt that it was not yet really finished our talk about it. Mm -hmm. uh, you can find it on the website, thewisdomfactory.net slash women minus matters minus January, because we have both on, uh, on this same page, minus 2019. And you find also the timestamps of the last, last meeting, so you can see what we were talking about. Today I will come for the moment, Monia Frubert from Vienna, Elisabeth Debord from Germany, also she is American, and Dorothy de Kucha, or Kucha, I don't know how you put it. Kucha, okay, good. Uh, and she is in Oregon in the USA, and maybe somebody else will still join us. So I think, Dorothy, you told us something about resilience, about our member of Women Matters, Victoria Duda. She probably won't come, I guess. And I give you first the, the word to tell us about what you see as resilience. Um, Victoria sent me a message about a week ago that a cottage that she had moved into recently that was full of all her talismans and her um, her life and it was a very safe sanctuary where she was writing and exploring the forest with her dog and learning about mushrooms uh, had had a pretty significant fire and the whole front part of her cottage uh, was burnt and the back two rooms survived but are covered with uh, smoke and water and, and damage. And so she had left and was living in Budapest, which is maybe two hours away. And I spoke with her two days ago thinking, oh my goodness, you know, what can I do? How can I support this, this woman and her trauma? And I was amazed when I talked to her because as she talked about how she had um, witnessed the fire and uh, responded to the horror of it and the devastation, um, she had in the very beginning decided that if she lost her outer sanctuary, what was important uh, was for her to maintain her inner sanctuary. And so she consulted with her higher power or God or spirits. She, you know, didn't define who that was. And she heard the message. She received the message. Um, eat no junk food. Eat only vegetables and fruits and some protein. Drink lots and lots of water. Get exercise daily outside and maybe there was something else. And she took that very, very much to heart, and she began to do that. And as she focused on her own inner locus of control, which is a big part of resilience, being connected to your ability to, to take on all that was called for when a tragedy or a loss or a disappointment happens, and she said it's made all the difference. She bought a new phone. She moved in with her mother. She was exploring her possibilities for a, the life she wanted to move toward, redoing the house, going to Greece where she could study about a book she was writing. I mean, she just laid out so many options. It was as if instead of facing a black wall of charred dreams, she kind of opened that up to reveal what other possibilities and desires might she have in the face of this um, tragedy. So it was within a week or two that she was able to rebound and reestablish herself in her own life and then look toward well, where will this life be? So I thought, wow, what, a, what an incredible example um, 
of resilience. Yeah, that's amazing. It's amazing. It's great. It, actually, what you said made me think about uh, the, what a delicate line it is between um, responding to someone as though they're, they, they're going to have trauma and, and a lot rather than, you know, that they're, we're, we're so tuned in psychologically, I think, particularly, particularly as women, and, and to protecting and caring for, but that that can, that can create a, a certain kind of victimization or can support a certain kind of um, a, a way of seeing oneself and others as victims. And part of what I hear you saying is, is that Victoria basically was like, I'm not a victim. I'm not a victim. I'm, I'm, this is my life. This is the next stage. Okay. There are things that I'm going to miss like my phone, like my, you know, my altar or the things that I've created, but obviously I have to move on. And, and there, it doesn't have to be a, a kind of tough, I'm going to tough it out, but, but, but a, an opening, at, which is what you're, you're describing. And that to me is resilience, you know, and, and I just wonder about how, Oh, how we, we also live so much in a culture of victimization, you know, where we see ourselves as victims, where we see each other as victims, where, and there's a, there's a, a positive aspect of that in, in the sense of wanting to care for each other, but there also is a, a way that is incredibly debilitating and, um, and that reinforces a certain narrative and a certain way of looking at one's own experience that, that, uh, that, that keeps us, pathetic <laughs> you know or or feeling like we can't do what victoria did why not you know it, it's you think about the i mean in germany germany austria the rubble women man they are amazing they i mean what they did was unbelievable unbelievable when you look at the pictures during austria after the after the war the piles 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 i mean you know, 10 meters high of, of, of broken stone and women picked it up, said, okay, we're going to do something here. And maybe that was also not dealing with their grief, but, but there's also something to be said for, for saying what's possible now. Okay. A kind of surrender into possibility rather than a surrender into, you know, thinking of oneself as a victim of life. Right. right. So I would like to say something to that too, because I think I'm, as an Enneagram type four, I'm very easy going into the victim ball, you know. Mm. But in my own life, I have seen when it's really needed, then you do. You just, you know, you, are, you don't have even time to think about if you're a victim. And I think the rubber woman, women were exactly this. That was... Mm -hmm. You need to do it. So we do it. You know, we don't even think a lot and don't make theories about it, but just just do it. And yeah, I I, I learned that for instance in, in near accident situations, you know, quite very clear, you know, I do the right thing. Afterwards, the knees, you know, but in these situations they're very, very, very present. But coming back to Victoria. I found it interesting because last time she said there is a different difference between toughness and resilience. And you said something about tough now too. And then you said, but for you, it's resilience. I think it's, 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 it's good to, to explore because I think in situations which are not really heavy, I would go through in the German toughness. So you have to do that. And so you mm -hmm. do it and you are tough and you do it, you know? But it's not necessarily resilience. It's like forcing yourself to do things uh, uh, which mm -hmm. are expected from you to do. So there are different levels of that, you know. The, 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 the more spontaneous mm -hmm. and resilient level is when it's really catastrophe. And burning your house, I think it's really a catastrophe. So then, then I, I mm -hmm. probably would be 
I, I just think about it. I would respond in a resilient way. In less important things, I would be tough. <laughs> Yeah. Well, um, I'm wondering because whenever I start to feel miserable about something or when I freeze or when I uh, sort of feel cornered, I get into action. That's j but I, that's just, I always thought that's just my nature. But maybe that's the way to deal and to get, to get uh, things moving again. Mm. So, um, but I, when, I, when you told that before we started about Victoria, uh, the first thing I thought about was, well, is she insured? Mm -hmm. And, <laughs> mm -hmm. but it doesn't really matter. So it's, uh, because if you really, if you cause the fire yourself by being negligible, negligent uh, I don't know if insurance companies will pay anything so you really you are on your own in a case like that and yeah it's not it's not the money it's it's resilience that matters it really matters because um, and uh, about the victimization as uh, Elizabeth re reminded us and reminded me um, after my rather serious operation of the aneurysmus, I never felt like a victim of, of fate or of whatever, because uh, I just got into action. I got into rebuilding myself mm -hmm. as, uh, as a whole. And I talked about it just this morning to someone and they were just shocked. And I never felt it that shocking. It was just the way things were and I got into action. Mm. So that's... I would like thing. to ask Elizabeth, you know, have studied about women. I have the feeling that it is more the feminine way when something is needed to be done, not to think and make theories and figure out the best way, but just we do it and we try to figure out while doing what might be the best way. Uh, do I you? think men do, men do that too, <laughs> but but I but I think you're, you're you're pointing to something else, and I think, and and it, it's a, and this is a question: Is this resilience? Women are survivors, and I don't even mean survivors of trauma or whatever. But but it it's it's uh, women will will will. I mean, there's there's a funny um, you know Eddie Izzard. The, the comic, the, the British comic. Yeah. Who who dresses in drag. He's 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 an amazing, amazing human being, really amazing human being. He tells a joke about uh, God said, Well, there are getting to be too many people on you know, on earth. We need to we need to I need to send down the the what we would call in English the Grim Reaper, you know, send death down to you know, the the planet and kind of maybe bring up bring up some some folks who have lived long lives and it's like, okay, we can. And uh, so the Grim Reaper comes back and says, um, you know, I got all the, all the old guys, but the women wouldn't let go. That's good. That's good. You know, the grannies, the grannies said, said no way. And, and, oh. you know, there, there's, there's something about our survival nature and is that resilience or is that something else I it, it's it I mean it's a genuine question is is uh, because I know I know that in that survival mode and also in that survival mode for our children we will do things that are are um, compromised um, from uh, that uh, you know like like the number of young women who are working in the porn industry right now and they say well I just can't find a job you know I, 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 I should be living on my own and paying my school loans but you know I I don't I don't know how to make money you know young men don't do that in that way you know, it, it's, it's like, so 
So they will survive, but there's a compromise that is a deep compromise in that. What, what, and, and is that resilience or is that something else? It, what you're saying makes me think about what I have heard that, um, and I, in some ways I have experienced that myself, not the fact, but uh, the, the reaction. When uh, women f uh, get raped, normally they dis uh, disconnect from the body and they can sort of be somewhere else, you know? Mm -hmm. And I had it, uh, the experience often in sexuality that I, I was somewhere else. You Dissociate, know? yeah. Dissociate. And I have read, maybe it was even Eckhart Tolle, I don't know where it was, that it is a, a long, long, long story of women to be able to disconnect from what is happening to their body and to go maybe in the spirit or whatever it is in some other realm to, to be able to survive. Maybe it is connected with that. That could be, yeah. Because maybe we, we need to survive because our children need us, no? So maybe it's a biological, biological thing that we can separate from the events <laughs> which are really happening to us. And uh, that's a thought. Mm. You know, when you talked about... Um, the thing that we that uh, I learned is that there was a, a craze in the United States about a response team that goes in on a crisis, on a trauma, on a tragedy, a uh, team of psychologists. And, you know, you go right in and you kind of bombard the survivors um, <clears throat> with all the psychological tools and skills and, you know, just a whole lot of um, support is what they thought it was. And then the research showed that that really interfered mm -hmm. with the individual's own way, process. Own, mm -hmm. own process, mm -hmm. own wisdom. You know, it's a journey. And, you know, with Victoria, you're talking a lot about, you know, kind of responding uh, in a practical way and doing what it takes. But when I'm looking at resilience, I think a lot about the psychological aspects of it and, you know, who am I and, you know, do I have a reservoir of self-confidence and practicality and, you know, as I'm looking at resilience, getting ready to do my conversation with Heidi, um, that where I spend my time is thinking about what it takes uh, inside, what it takes in terms of spirit and, and, um, um, self-image and support systems. So I, I think that resilience has a lot of complexities and um, I don't often think about, you know, a rapid response like you're talking about, you know, going through the rubble because somehow I think after a trauma, the trauma buries itself in us unless part of our action healing is experiencing the loss and that's what i said to victoria because her mother is like pushing her to get on with it get on with it you know and it reminded me of after a, a, a death people say okay well it's been two years now it's time for you to stop with this and get back to your life and i just told her to the extent that she deals with the loss and the fear and the sadness and you know the big feelings that come when you watch your dream being burnt you know that that's equally important as deciding whether she's going to Greece or deciding whether she's going to rebuild the porch. I really, I, I stand for the emotional journey um, and how wonderful to go through the rubble right away. And that might be a, a coping mechanism of, you know, just the emotional part is too strong. And so I'm going to do something practical for now, but at two o'clock in the morning when the hour of the wolf comes, I'm sure that emotional stuff comes calling for recognition and uh, attention also. I'm, I'm not just, that practical. I'm, I'm still mulling over what Elizabeth said about women resorting to, did you say to the porn industry or prostitution? doesn't matter because as I see it there is much more demand from men for this I don't know when many women who 
want male prostitutes or, or, or so maybe it's just a question of the market how the how the demand is and and who yeah we have many uh, uh, they call it now Laufhäuser I don't know how this translates into English uh, because uh, women are no longer allowed to be on the streets so they are in houses or in cars they drive around in cars and uh, but I, I don't think that the demand for m male prostitutes is as big as it is for female so that's just a basic question of the market and but, but but of all the jobs hmm? but of all the jobs that there are all of the ways to make money well this is one of the easiest but. <laughs> this is one of the easiest uh, and if the women really separate themselves from their bodies uh, yeah maybe it's you get a lot of money for just spreading your legs which is uh, yeah oh well <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm wondering uh, where does resilience start and in cornered end so if you what end? Being cornered. being cornered if you come to uh, a different well no it's it's not that it's not that simple it's um, and even it's maybe simpler because we have so many uh, prostitutes from the eastern countries from because they are cheaper and people men get them into the country and under pretenses uh, So when you have been promised to be a massage or whatever, uh, what is just decent, decent. <laughs> um, and then there is nothing for you to work. Yeah. And that really gets me mad because uh, our society, as long as there is a demand, won't interfere seriously. We interfere with cannabis very seriously because we are a wine growing country. And that's uh, that as a far I have been told that both alcohol and cannabis don't mix. Mm -hmm. So uh, it boils down to uh, capitalism and to the market. And that really gets me mad because. Mm -hmm. huh. So I want to put in here another thing. I have heard that today uh, for men it's very difficult to to get into sexual uh, um, relationships because they fear the women they fear to be sued for for oh. um, uh, for something wrong you know and so maybe instead of decreasing the demand for prostitutes we by doing that we have increased that we mm. I mean, collectively we the women who are accusing uh, men publicly for abuse maybe just mm -hmm. to put it in there what do you think elizabeth um i i don't know i i mean i i think uh i mean i think that 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 i think they're, they're the you're talking sort of about me too but, but I mean, I read an article the other day that said Me Too has not trickled down to everyone, you know, to the lives of most people. There's, there are these, you know, star, stars who have been knocked out of the sky, um, you know, very powerful men. But it hasn't sent a message to, to men in general that this is not going to be okay any longer. In fact, it doesn't, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't doesn't seem to have made made much difference and men are saying now i don't want to mentor a young woman because i'm afraid i'm going to get called out but that doesn't and all that means is that the woman's 
prospects of learning and developing in their in their work. Is she frozen now, or am I frozen? Yeah. No, she's, she's frozen. frozen. Oh, okay. uh, we can't hear you, Elizabeth, and you are frozen. Yeah, maybe she can. Yeah. Yeah. I have heard that on the workplace, men are very, uh, um, at least in America, very uh, cautious not to touch a woman and so they to each other. something because. Have I frozen? Yes, you were. Now you are unfrozen. Yeah, you're frozen, but we can. Oh, there she Oops. goes. <laughs> <laughs> now she's gone. Um, so that they have fear uh, to be then accused. Oh, here she is back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I I think that's uh, just a hype. Even in, in well, I'm no longer uh, working, and it's just a hype. Uh, make women more insecure about the topic i am not sure but um it, it's no topic for my daughters or my granddaughters what do you mean it's not a topic it's not a topic for my daughter or my granddaughters because they have always been very self-assured and uh, they had a job where they don't even need any support on a couch so yeah. it's, uh, i was talking about the men and the workplace not about the women on the workplace that they yeah, but the men the men uh, in austria at least they only you know yeah. in austria there's this oh now i can't make her a compliment because she looks nice and then uh, that's stupid so that's just it's not taken seriously by the men good to know mm -hmm. Yeah, and then in last time we talked also resilience and meaning in life. Mm. Uh, and we could explore this a little bit more. Is this connected? And if so, how? I just saw uh, um, a TED talk with a, with a woman who, how she, I can't remember how she started doing this. I, uh, I, um, but she wanted to find out what is it that makes someone successful in as a teacher, as an engineer, as a soldier, as a, you know, all different, different places in life. What, what, what is the thing that makes someone successful in, in any context? And she said it was she, what she's labeled it. And I think it's very related to resilience is grit. <laughs> And, but what she, the way she defined grit was, and I think this is where meaning comes in, mm -hmm. is that, that, um, that it, it, it's the ability to persevere despite setbacks for a vision of a long, a, a long-term vision. And I think that's the meaning part. You know, I'm doing this for something. I'm doing this because I care about that. You know, this is that, that the, that, this is deeply important to me. And maybe that, that deeply important thing may be that I am seen as like the most amazing, you know, whatever in the world. Uh, it may be narcissistic. It may have a narcissistic future to it, but, but still there's some kind of, kind of long-term goal that, that people are willing to, to persevere for and face whatever discomfort um, that, they, that, they may, that they may have. And that's, uh, I think that has a lot to do with meaning. Wondering if perseverance has something to do with stubbornness. Mm -hmm. uh, I read that in uh, Walter Hasselmann's book about being stubborn. And uh, well, maybe I'm, I'm rather stubborn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, because if something matters to me, I can go on for years, mm -hmm. and finally I succeed. Mm -hmm. But that's uh, yeah. So that's why I'm married for fifty-four years. <laughs> it's, I've been married for fifty-four years now. Mm -hmm. So uh, what you are talking about is that you have already a meaning in your life, no? And then you are stubborn and have grit 
to, to go towards it. If people don't feel they have a meaning in their life, would it be possible to build resilience? Or as we last time said, maybe resilience, we come to the world with having more, uh, let's say, um, capacity for resilience or less resilience. Can we develop it? And out of that find meaning of life? Well, it meaning, it depends on how your narrative, um, how your, what was it in English? Narrative? Narrative. narrative. Mm -hmm is constructed and people with more fantasy maybe have better narratives mm. so uh, like uh, how many lives have I lived or what was I in a former life or which the Buddha says doesn't really matter so what matters is your life now your incarnation nevertheless uh, It's just a story you tell yourself, the meaning of your life, isn't it? Heidi, correct yeah, yeah. Now we are doing the, the curve back to Harari, who says everything is a story. Yeah. Does he? Oh, well, that's, yeah. uh, I have read a lot about narrative and I'm perfect in it. I mean, it's just, uh, I can give you stories of my life <laughs> that are just fantastic. Yeah. yeah. I think meaning is attached to value. When I care about something, then um, I move toward toward it. I, I harness myself toward achieving or enjoying or accomplishing it. I think people who are able to keep to meaning make, to make meaning out of what gives them pleasure, what satisfies them, what holds value are people that we can say are resilient because they're moving toward that goal. And I, I, I think that, you know, I looked more at resilience, like the comment I made in between everything else. Um, I, I see it more as a response, not, I'm looking at it as a response to trauma as a response to big losses. I'm not looking at, at it, you know, as a kind of a, a daily um, moving toward something or being stubborn. You know, I, I was analyzing it like a psychologist or a counselor would do if someone comes in with a, a big piece of their life suddenly broken and they begin then to rebuild that. that that's what I've always thought of resilience. The other is, you know, focus and purpose and direction. And I mean, all of that is, is part of what allows you to re respond and react and bounce back. But resilience to me is always held more of a recovery from something very difficult. So I, setbacks... Setbacks would be, you know, in the pursuing of your goal, when you have setbacks, that would be then a case for showing resilience or not. Yes. Yeah, it, it would. You know, the ability to not let that setback um, push you too far off your path, that nevertheless, you'll find a way to go on. But so, I, I see it as a double pronged, not only picking up the rubble and creating something out of it, but dealing with emotionally the impact it has on you, the disappointment, the self-doubt that might come, you know, all of those very human uh, emotional uh, aspects. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm, I'm interested in that. Uh, I'm still hanging with um, being your group of therapists if somebody is traumatized uh, so you just swamp them with advice with analysis uh, after the war nobody gave any analysis to anybody uh, and still the women and the men who came back uh, lived their, continued their lives uh, some of them died earlier due to the war, uh, but you had no therapist and you were not called a victim. 
you were called. I don't know what you what they called themselves. I they built know. up the, the the nation again, no? Yeah, yeah. That's that's the recon reconstructing the nation. That's what they saw themselves, uh, but they didn't see themselves as victims. And they well, didn't that talk. But well, that. My mm. Is it frozen now? Of someone to normalize their experience, mm -hmm. someone to give them some tools to recover from the loss of their whole family and the loss of their lives and the loss of their language and the loss of their country, then my life and my brother's life would be very different. Mm -hmm. And I think the therapists who rush in can definitely obstruct the own individual strength building recovery process. That's what I said before. Mm -hmm. But for people who get nothing, um, <laughs> It's a different and difficult story then that the legacy they pass on to their children is one of don't trust anyone, mm -hmm. you know, any at any minute, everything could be taken. We were innocent and we were victims. So I think we're talking about two different groups. And it's interesting for me to hear a, a, an Austrian who stayed there respond to how people rose to the occasion of reclaiming their country and mm. how my family you know didn't have that opportunity because they were so busy building a whole new life well it's the holocaust you can't compare to anything it's the biggest trauma that still uh, goes on mm. it's uh and whatever you 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 talk about it it doesn't really get to where this desperation sits i mean reading about it uh i still can't believe it that it happened that people can just kill them or let them know oh i i got a book about uh, why did they follow him mm -hmm. the austrians and the germans and this is uh, quite interesting uh, because they said it's the way it was a kind of trance uh, talking to people, tiring them in the beginning. And after about two hours standing there as a Mars, uh, then you got some commands and people were in a kind of collective trance at that time. This might explain it. I, I don't know, but uh, it's still hard because when we now listen to these old tapes, it's just ridiculous the way they talk. And what in this book, it also said that uh, there were many schools to imitate it, Hitler's way to speak to people. And... Uh, it might be an explanation, I don't know, because I got this book from someone who, who really studies what happened to his parents and grandparents at that time. And he, whatever material he gets, he reads it. And he found that might be an explanation to get people to do what they want. That is this mass, the collective hysteria channeled. Well, yeah. well, well, there is also unbelievable... I mean, there was also trauma that the, that the, that the German-speaking people were coming out of. And the, the depression in Europe mm -hmm. was not at all like the depression in the United States. Right. It was, um, I mean, you had very well-off people selling their daughters, talk about prostitution, <laughs> to anybody who visited in order to be able to, to you know, get their meals. Um, mm -hmm. The, and, and also Hitler forgave debt from farmers who were struggling, small, small business people. He created, he, I mean, it's like Donald Trump. Yeah, 
Yep. I mean, it's not, yep. Trump has not gone there yet. <laughs> but, uh, and hopefully he won't. But look at how, look at how dulling the effect of Trump is on the American psyche, on how it becomes normalized. I mean, he, the way he talks is, is, is crazy. He mm -hmm. talks like a nine-year-old, yeah. a nine-year-old mm -hmm. with, with some kind of real strange, really strange kind of disorder. He, you know, mm -hmm. he's, he is, he is, uh, he, he's, I mean, the things that he says are, are deeply troubling and, 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 uh, and fright, really frightening. Yeah. But that's not, that's not the point. Just as with Hitler, why does, is there a team around him? Why do people work with him? Why do, uh, don't they just say, that's no way to a president to be? Why don't they just, what's the word, upsetzen? Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Ca cancel him. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, uh, you can do it. Impeach yeah. him. Get him. Impeach, impeach. impeach, that's impeach. It, yeah. Why don't they impeach him? Uh, but with it, Hitler, it was the same. He had his, his military, he had his people as advisors. He was suffering from diabetes. He probably was crazy uh, after a certain time. But why, he, did they, why did everybody else just support him? That's what because they had, they had an interest in that. Because mm -hmm. he promised a whole lot of stuff and people were desperate to believe it. And then they slowly entered into this mindset. And I recommend to you to listen to the Jordan Peterson's psychological lectures on, on he studied uh, totalitarianism and he explains mm -hmm. how normal people can become atrocious. Mm -hmm. How this is a slow process. It's not from one day to the other. Yeah. And he yeah. says the uh, German uh, people were sort of behind Hitler because they, they bought into into this, they didn't say stop at the right time, let's say, mm -hmm. and they didn't feel uh, like they could. And when they realized it was too late. Yeah, and there, are a lot, there are a lot of conversations in the United States right now about where is that point? Mm -hmm. Have we hit that point? Are we crossing that line? Are we, mm -hmm. you know, what is, uh, are we safe? Are the structures of, of our democracy strong enough? Will they protect us? They'll protect us. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's, it's a very, Ah, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's, a, it's quite a, a dangerous time. And, and Viktor Orban, um, Erdogan, I mean, the guy in Poland, it, it's like, this isn't a joke. You know, we're, I, I feel we're, we're, a talk, this is going to be an interesting, interesting um, thing to see if, if, if the West and the different countries of the West have enough cultural resilience Mm -hmm. enough deep connection with their own values, which I'm not sure we do, okay. um, to be able to, to take some of the temptations that, 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 were, that were afoot in the, in the 30s, and, and if we can take a different route, you know, route this time. So Harari has to say something interesting to that. I just listened to a talk he gave about one and a year, one and a half years ago, and he says that the situation today is completely different. So, uh, you know, as we said before, Germany came out of the depression, out of uh, losing the First World War, oppressed with all the reparation payments, which they couldn't pay. And today it's different. So he says he doesn't think that it is a, a real danger, uh, the the um, the move to the to the right uh, he 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 says it's more the discontent with what is going on and probably the first sign of a serious rupture rupture you say mm -hmm. the interruption rupture. which right. needs to come because the times are changing he says it's we are real on a on a on a disruption point and so um, sort of. That's what I got out of that, no? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, uh, but it wouldn't be like, uh, like it, not yet, he said. Not yet. It could, yeah? But not, mm -hmm. because the, also today with the connection, the economic connection, which was not so strong in those mm -hmm. times, you know? Uh, it's, it's difficult that it will be uh, the same, so. Mm -hmm. Well, Europe now has to uh, face the Brexit. Mm. and what comes from it. And when you look at what is happening, I, I only know that from the papers, but what is happening in Great Britain in the political system, uh, the party splitting up, 
uh, I wonder if we are, yeah, maybe we are just too impatient and too fast now with all the modern technology that we really, and there's a reflex and uh, you don't really think in between. Yeah. I want to say something too, the John Bonzo, you know, I don't know if you know him, uh, he is talking about that the party system will be obsolete. And mm -hmm. I lately, just last week, I saw Otto Sharma and this was uh, in a, a, um, a webinar. And this was really impressing to me. He said, now it's not anymore right and left. Mm -hmm. Today, it's the difference, and so not the parties anymore, uh, but about open-minded and closed-minded. Mm -hmm. And that will completely change the whole landscape. And I think maybe this party system will break, but we have to have some, some time. Uh, you know, it won't do immediately. It, will, it can be, can be uh, not, not pretty, <laughs> but it seems to be... A change seems to be on the way. So I, it was quite convincing what both of them said. So resilience, cultural resilience. I like that. Mm. Do we have cultural resilience? Mm. So far, it seems to work more or less. No. Uh, but but I, I think that that the that the the, the polarization that's happening is is. Uh, suggests that, that maybe it's weakening. <laughs> the sort of belief in a uh, liberal democracy, I think, is, 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 is less strong than it was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a belief in the, in, the, in the political elite or, you know, to steer things in the right direction, um, I think, is, is people don't have faith in that. But I do think, I, I mean, I do think in America and, and much less so in Germany um, that, that there is such a, such a vacuum in terms of human values, mm. Um, mm. such a, uh, that things have become so consumer driven, so consumption driven, um, and it's so upside down. I mean, the whole tax cut for the, the most wealthy people, I mean, it's just, things are, things are really... I don't see, I, I'm not sure that America has, the United States has much resilience at this point. And I mean, if there were a real crisis in America, rather than the fake crises that are, that are being manufactured, I, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't think this administration would be able to, to respond, would know what would mm -hmm. be up for it. But I also don't know where, if, if the American people could, could, would, would rise to the occasion in the way that they have in the past. There's, um, so the I mean, it's interesting. The resilience I see in our country and around in Europe to the Swedish and uh, are, the young, are the young people. Maybe they don't know, mm -hmm. uh, maybe they don't have all the limitations that uh, the adults have, we've kind of given up and got solidified in, in the complexity of it. But the, the kids that are trying to get the guns uh, banned, mm -hmm. the children who lost their friends, and the Swedish kids from uh, that want to, you know, take responsibility for the environment. And mm -hmm. we have students here in Oregon that are, you know, going to the Supreme Court to sue the country for having violated the trust of their clean water. And so I think the resilience I'm seeing is in children and youngsters. Mm -hmm as well as in uh, small groups all around the world, like mushrooms that are connecting and that are quietly or with some, some uh, awareness of others uh, beginning to work toward changes, global mm -hmm. changes, country changes. So I don't know if we can leave our adult kind of parameters and, and legacies and customs but it seems like there's a swell here of uh, knowledgeable and energetic, uh, dedicated young people. Mm. I think that's great what you're saying, Dorothy, because I think, think that, that uh, it's like if you talk about resilience in the system as it is and to those who are upholding it, I, either people at the top or at the bottom upholding that system and wanting to seek value or their own 
you know, their own sense of self-worth through that system. I, that's what I don't think has resilience. But I agree with you. But I agree with you that there are human beings that, um, so friends of mine all use the term mycelium. That there, that there, that there's the the root network in the for the for the mushrooms in the forest that 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 is that is being that's being created. I I'm I know that's the case, and that you know how. I think it's going to be a mess though in between this this behemoth dying and uh and 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 new ways being patched together in order in order for life to to um you know spring forth as always well i guess you all know that we have a rather young chancellor now mm -hmm. just 30 and uh they have still this dem uh, demos at uh, every Friday now, since this new government is uh, working very hard and just doing what they promised during the campaign, and there are there are now the uh, grandmothers against right. Uh -huh. <laughs> they have knitted red hats, and they interviewed them, and it was uh, people from the left uh, quarters who interviewed them, and they said, "They he just makes me nervous that young man." So. They are so solidified already. They just know to do what they have done all their life. Uh, and he tries to find different ways. And that makes them nervous. They have no arguments. Mm -hmm. They just have emotions. Well, but he is, he is far right, isn't he? He's no. middle. And maybe he's even integrally informed. Mm. This is what I, uh, I talked to him personally a couple of years ago and I told him about the integral system and spiral dynamics and everything and sometimes he really looks informed to me no he isn't far right definitely not no he is what you would think he's the middle what uh, the yeah like uh, it's the same with the anti-atomic movement of the green people now green in the beginning it was just every party i myself i wore this button against atomic power and on my loden cape mm -hmm. and uh, at that time uh, the conservatives and the liberals they all uh, this is why we didn't build an atomic power plant in austria because they had a, a decision was made by the people and they said, no, we don't want an atomic power plant. But uh, now it became a party. And as we all know, uh, the green, now spiral dynamics and the green party uh, are very arrogant. They believe they are the top of the spiral and this is why they lost. And this is why now everything moves towards the right. And we hope that it will also, there will be a, a party that stays with values of the, of the people, of the middle. Uh, before this is what, I can't remember what bürgerlich is, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, push <laughs> was. Um, yeah. Uh, but I'm very glad that this young man, because he sort of uprooted the whole system of the Conservative Party. And that's amazing to, to achieve that. And he's always polite and he listens. He listens most of the time. He listens. He doesn't give any advice. He listens. And this makes people very nervous because they are not used to people listening to them. I mean, the interviewers, the journalists. And when, when even leftist, leftist journalists have to admit that what he does is quite a good thing at this time. So uh, my hopes rest with him, although he's only 30. <laughs> so maybe we give up left, left and right, because yeah. I think this polarization yeah. and yeah. put it into boxes, a right and left, and then yeah. far right is, yeah. uh, of, is becoming a, a sort of a, 
a negative um, threat as soon as you are not left, you are far right or something, you know, I think it's, it's not good. And yeah. the idea to see it and the open-minded and closed-minded instead of right and left, I, I really like that. Yeah. Because they mm -hmm. seem to be very old uh, concepts, the right and left uh, uh, itself, you know, so. We will but, see if it's comes open but the open-minded and closed-minded, I don't know if that's just maybe a trick because if you're open-minded, it might mean that you agree with the ideas of uh, more contemporary ideas that global warming is, is happening, that it's important to do something. And if you're closed-minded, you don't believe it, you deny it, which is exactly what describes the right and the left in our country. So mm -hmm. That's always been an understanding of mine that, you know, they've even done brain scans that I've read about. And a conservative brain is organized and is physically different than a um, liberal brain. And therefore, the two have such a hard time communicating and convincing or exploring things together. And we, too, have these young women now, black women and um, you know, women of, you know, Puerto Rican women and, you know, really, really young women who've entered our Congress and our hopes are on them. But they're also, like you said, a part of the system and they have a real investment in their open mind, which means the ideas of the closed mind people don't, there isn't much room for those ideas. So mm -hmm. I don't understand how redefining it as open-minded and closed mind is any different than uh, liberal with the big open mind and conservative with the little squeezed ideas. Mm -hmm. it, doesn't, it doesn't seem like it's a whole new uh, Heidi way mm -hmm. of describing how differently human beings perceive reality and possibility and all of that. Mm -hmm. I think that I think that's interesting, Dorothy. And to add to that, I have a um, someone I know who is the leader of a community and and is uh, you know thinks that 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 uh, the, the the Holocaust never happened, et cetera, et cetera. And he doesn't understand why people aren't more open minded, you know, to consider all these theories that that are you know that are out there, um, you know, basically denying denying things that that have been historically documented he doesn't understand you know why aren't you more open-minded and just thinking you know to, to to take in all these things and 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 you know respond respond to them from yourself and if you have a reaction against it that's proof to him that you're you're closed-minded and and that you're invested in in not seeing what could be true well, I guess, but that's not what Heidi and Otto Sharma meant. Uh, and again, I come back to listening to people and accepting what they, there are different maybe opinions. Uh, and uh, it's just when my husband and I are of a different opinion, uh, that's what I say. I say, well, we differ on this subject. Full stop. Hmm. Uh, Fighting uh, about politics in particular is such a waste of time. It really is. And uh, I have very, very close and dear friends on, in all parties. And what I do now in, in our salon in Vienna, I brought them together. Cool. Mm. Yeah, very cool. I sat in the middle because I'm a translator. And so... And the funny thing was that uh, our uh, going back to the 68 revolution, uh, he all of a sudden sounded a lot more conservative than mm -hmm. some of the other uh, people present. So that was really amazing. And they talked to each other. Mm. That's good. And uh, yeah, that's what uh, the most important thing is that I listen, I listen to both of them and um, I try to find a common basis. But as such, 
I always feel now that this old Chinese curse is really applying on everybody. May you live in interesting times. <laughs> that's right. And that's what's really happening. And my husband and I, we just look at each other, interesting times again. <laughs> yeah, they're yeah. interesting times. And I want also still to the end say, we have both parts in us too. Every conservative has a liberal part in themselves and every liberal has a conservative part in themselves. So, and I think also spiral dynamics and uh, these things could help uh, a lot more to understand that and be open to listen. I think you, you nailed it, Monica. Yeah. It's about listening and that doesn't depend on being conservative or, or, or liberal, but if you wanting to understand and instead of... Uh, giving uh, slogans, no? uh, words uh, of, of, of ideology. And ideology on both parts is not a good, a good way, in my opinion. So, Whoa, resilience. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I need to, I need to yeah. go. Yeah. I, thank yeah. you. And so thank, thank you very much. For joining. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so pleasure. much. Bye -bye. Thank you. See you next time. Bye-bye. Uh, Bye-bye. Yeah, I think we can do a last word and then we can uh, stop too. Some check out or summary or what you want to say. Well, I'm left still with the question that um, I originally was thinking about that what is the difference between the resilience work or what's called on to for people like we we're speaking about, the Germans that were in their country and suffered their losses and went through the rubble and the victims of the Holocaust who lost all that. What, what was called on that was different would be interesting for me to hear from both of those two groups because that was a dichotomy. <laughs> you know, that, that there is no way that anyone was listening to anyone at that point, you know, decisions were made. So I would still, that as a psychologist, my orientation is more toward, you know, what was it that the German people had to learn and do and explore as different than what the Jewish people had to do and learn and explore? Yeah, we that, could do an extra and talk I, about that. Because there's so many Germans, you know, there in the group to, you know, so far all I heard was that, you know, without thinking twice, the women went into the rubble and started to rebuild, which, you know, is a very important aspect too. But what was their healing like in terms of any regret or guilt or, you know, confusion or all that, you know, what, how did the German people process that event in history? Well, you mentioned it already about your parents. They didn't talk about it, did they? No. Mine didn't. Your parents. No. And my parents didn't talk about it either uh, because some of our relatives were with the Nazi movement and they, they progressed in their job much faster. My, my father wasn't. He was with the... Uh, he was a dentist, and he worked with when when he was drawn into the military. Uh, he uh, sanitaire, a sanitator, so he the lazarets, so he had to care for the wounded, and that sort of uh, really when he came back, he he never talked about anything. He was so traumatized. Uh, but I, I remember him standing at our windows and looking down when uh, the socialists, who some uh, people claim that they exchanged the swastika against the red coronation mm -hmm. after the war, uh, when they, uh, for the first May parades, when they collect, uh, well, where they are under our window, he stood there and I never could ex explain the way he looked at them. But he remembered, obviously, that some of the energy of this of the Nazi time was here transported again. This we is my, this is my uh, what I now, as a child, I didn't I didn't understand, 
but he yeah he was there was a lot of rage in him but he never voiced it because he was a very quiet man so um, the fact that then the socialist movement no we, i did once a course with don beck and he made very clear that the the fundamentalists on both sides switch immediately it's much more easy to switch from one side to the other than going into the more moderate uh, 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 um, position of their own belief system have so, you ever so seen the movie of herr karl mm -mm. oh quite try to find it it's it's um the way he talks about the war and how he experiences it and he sits down there in a cellar and uh, has to sort out some uh, vegetables or whatever and it's really makes your hair stand up in your neck that's so, the name of the movie is Herr Karl Herr Karl and it's Helmut Kweitinger Oh, Quaitinger, Quaitinger, with a Q. Yeah. Quaitinger. You might find it somewhere, yeah. Yeah, maybe YouTube, everything's on YouTube. But, yeah. uh, uh, Dorothy, I think we could talk about that quite well because I think the main work on healing is done by the next generation. That means my generation and maybe the generation after that. I know that I'm always still very, very much touched and uh, and feel it in myself when I listen to stories and when I, you know, I, I hardly can watch uh, movies about this time. Mm. So, uh, and there's also a very nice book, and now I've forgotten the title in German, something like this, no, I've forgotten, something about the second generation who is working out the, well, the silence of their parents. So, my daughter's were born in New York City, so they ha uh, have American citizenship, mm -hmm. and also, and their way, the way they approach people is still very much American. They are very open, mm -hmm. and uh, so maybe it's the third generation that finally does the healing. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. The second is getting aware of it and is still suffering about because we don't really can go back and ask and talk with our parents anymore. It's too late. They are gone, and even if they are not gone, they, you know, they have buried it. They don't want psychologically. They don't want to open the, 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 the worms. How do you say the the box with the worms? So, they Pandora's box. Yeah, they have sort of found a, um, an equilibrium in their lives, and they don't want to go back anymore. And I think it's really our generations who. We're doing it, and Germany has done a lot. I, Austria, I'm sure too. Um, many cultural things, starting in the 80s, to 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 work on that. So much more than America has done with the uh, genocide okay. of. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, let's do another show about that. Maybe <laughs> we find other people to be interested. So okay, okay. okay. I stopped the recording just now.